Hello, and welcome back to another episode. Now today, I want to share with you something of an underappreciated gem from the director, Danny Boyle. This is a sci-fi epic that somehow slipped under the radar, and uh, I, I don't know, I, I, it's, it's a real shame. I find it genuinely frustrating that so many people haven't given this film its, its, its dues. It actually came out at the perfect time for me, though. It came out in April 2007, at a time when I was uh, at the end of my university career. I think my exams were a good way off yet, but I had a little bit of time to just to just to myself where I could indulge something, and I decided to indulge this movie. I was a huge fan of the films that Danny Boyle had done before, for example, 28 Days Later, in particular, and uh, and I went to the to the cinema. Uh, expecting something interesting and it delivered. In fact, in the course of that week I actually felt, saw the film twice. And as a student that's, yeah, that's quite a big thing to go and see a movie twice in a week, you know, with the exception of things like Star Wars. Uh, students don't really have the money to do that and frankly neither did I. But this film uh, insisted on my attention and it got it. Now ironically Sunshine came out in the US in July on the hottest day of the year and therefore it underperformed at the box office. It cost around 40 million to make which by many sci-fi standards is relatively modest but it only made about 32 million in the box office and therefore is technically classified as a, as a failure. But this film is so much more, so much more than a failure. Now this video will contain no uh, major spoilers for this movie. There, there is a there is a story and uh, an element of a twist in this film, which deserves to be experienced, as it were, for the first time unspoiled. Uh, but I will talk about the setup for this film, the first portion of the movie. Uh, and actually, this this whole movie starts out with a shot that's, that that feels as though you're looking at the sun. You, you you're convinced that this is the sun that you're looking at. The film is called Sunshine, and we're looking at a golden orb approaching us, or rather, we're approaching it, I suppose. And then, bit by bit, it becomes clear that actually this is a golden disc which is coming towards us. And this is the shield which is protecting a spaceship that's heading towards the sun. The whole thing is, is voiced uh, and narrated, as it were, by um, Killian Murphy, who plays a character called Kappa, who is the ship's physicist. And he lays out the mission for the crew. This is the Icarus II, the second spaceship sent by Earth towards the sun to try and restart, reignite the sun uh, as it is dying and Earth is therefore cooling down. And this, if this crew fails, then everyone dies. The, the, you know, the stakes are epic, and, uh, and actually the line is quite clever, and in that sense quite epically um, brief. This is all about eight astronauts strapped to the back of a nuclear bomb. Uh, a bomb the size of Manhattan heading towards the sun. So this crew of eight people is actually really rather well selected, as you would expect from a NASA type mission, uh, but also in particular when it comes to the casting of the crew. First of all we have the captain, uh, played by uh, Hiro Hiroyuki Sanada. Uh, he plays Kanada and he is an excellent presence on board this ship. I would follow him into hell as it were. And it's quite clear that the crew respects the captain. He is he is um, fairly quiet, but he's also absolute in terms of his judgments. He listens to the best of opinions, and then he expects people to follow what he has deemed to be, to be the best course of action. Uh, next in command, we have a character called uh, Harvey, played by Tony Garrity. And Harvey is the comms officer, and he's, uh, shall we say, a less stable personality. Next, in terms of seniority, in terms of the importance to the crew, we have Kappa, played by Killian Murphy. Uh, at this point, I suppose I, I knew him best from work such as in Batman Begins, uh, as playing the scare Scarecrow. Uh, and he, he, he brings uh, an interesting presence here, in so much as he's playing an American and not an Irishman. Uh, he, his performance is quite good, but also he is essentially uh, the audience's character, I guess. Uh, we are, he, he is entrusted to us, we are entrusted to him as the, as the person who we follow through the movie. 
we have, um, let's see, uh, Trey, played by Benedict Wong, and Trey is the navigation officer. Uh, he's also uh, seemingly in charge of ca various calculations linked with uh, fuel economy um, and also vectors as they travel through space, the, the speed and, and direction that they're going. And uh, he plays well, an important role in this film. We have Mace, played by Chris Evans, and he is seemingly in a, a similar rank to uh, the character of Cassie, played by Rose Byrne. Chris Evans we recognise, well, obviously, as Captain America from the Marvel movies. And Rose Byrne, I suppose, in terms of popularity, in popularity and exposure, is probably best known as, uh, as a an, an member of the FBI, uh, no, the CIA, sorry, in uh, the most recent X-Men movies. They are the pilots of the ship, and they actually represent two different aspects of humanity. Rose Byrne's character, Cassie, is very uh, motherly, very humane, cares a lot, an awful lot for her crew members in a very, in a very emotional way. And uh, Mace, Chris Evans's character, is much more on point. He's mission centric. He's logical, uh, and at sometimes, you know, at some points, he seems a bit cold. But we'll we'll come to that, back to that in a moment. We have uh, Corazon, played by Michelle uh, Michelle Yeoh. She is a wonderful, again, a wonderful grounding motherly female presence in the film, and she is in charge of the garden on board the ship. I'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, and uh, we have Searle, played by Cliff Curtis. Uh, Searle is... <sighs> Searle is... Uh, well, he is he is the extra human presence. He is he is there to uh, to to I suppose represent the oddities of humanity. He is in fact actually the psych officer on board. He represents uh, what should be the grounding element, but he's also arguably, uh, as Chris Evans's Mace character says, less sane than the rest of the crew. And this whole crew has been sent out into space in the context of a failed first mission. The Icarus One has seemingly disappeared. No one knows quite what happened to it. Icarus Two, with this crew on board, is sent towards the sun, and this is the last best hope for humanity. They have mined all of Earth for uh, resources and materials, things like uranium, that will, which will enable them to reignite this uh, dying star, our sun. And, uh, and the stakes, you do feel them. Uh, this is important. And you're with this crew as they're heading on this life or death mission. This is where design is crucial. This film is a pinnacle of sci-fi design. Lots of people uh, more recently have pointed towards the marsh as being a vision of, of what humanity could achieve in the near future in space in terms of going to Mars. But actually, Sunshine was an attempt to do that back in 2007. I think possibly the ending of the film uh, slightly undermined that serious scientific element. And again, we'll, yeah, we'll come to that in a bit. But actually, the, the design of the ship is very much like NASA Plus, a series of pods connected together, much like the International Space Station is today, uh, which includes, for example, a garden on board, this sort of Garden of Eden almost, that is providing the crew with oxygen. We have uh, a very uh, alien-esque, as in the first Alien movie, sort of dinner um, pod where people share meals, they cook for each other, they have conversations. Um, we have the bridge, which is very much like a, a really good, solid, traditional sci-fi bridge. And we also have, obviously have elements of, for example, airlocks and a sort of a hollow deck like room on board, which is used by Searle to treat people when they're becoming psychologically stressed. And actually that's the next element of this, is that the whole film is all about the effect of space on astronauts. Danny Boyle was in particular fascinated by the fact that astronauts, when they go to the moon, often come back uh, to Earth and have very dysfunctional relationships with people who, who, who they've always loved, you know. Um, childhood sweethearts are torn apart when one of them goes to space and comes back. It's an experience that, that, that can't really be shared adequately and that does have an effect on one's psychology. And, and this film, I suppose, on the one hand, is an attempt to explore the psychology of space travel, but it's also a very deep philosophical, near-religious exploration of space travel as well. There is, for example, the constant presence of the sun in this film. It is their end goal. 
it may well be their end in that sense. All of the crew are prepared to die. And this film is all about uh, uh, heading towards an, a beautiful danger. And in fact, space itself is a beautiful danger in this film. It's a hazard. It is there uh, uh, a little bit like the water outside a submarine. It, it is always ready to kill the crew. And you cannot underestimate just how dangerous space travel is in this film. The sun represents and comes to represent psychologically uh, an all-consuming obsession in almost all the characters. In fact, at one point, Cassie is commenting to Kappa after he wakes up from a nightmare about falling into the sun, that, it, that it's all that she can dream about as well. They become obsessed with this because presumably they've trained for it so, so, so intensely. But also, this is the only place that they're heading to. They are, they are moving towards the sun, the thing that gives everything on Earth life. This tension between science and, I suppose, philosophy or religion is present throughout the film. Danny Boyle himself actually wanted to be a priest at one point in his life and filmmaking came a, came a knocking when he first saw uh, the uh, Clockwork Orange. And uh, as, uh, on the one hand, therefore, I suppose you have a, a, a philosophically or religiously sensitive being being balanced, in fact, by a scientific advisor in the shape of Brian Cox, who's gone on to be a, a scientific celebrity, I guess, in the UK. He is the face, the public face of science for many people here. But, uh, but, but at the time, he was a relatively unknown astrophysicist working at Manchester University, having once been in a very popular band in the, in the 80s and 90s. But crucially, um, he provided Danny Boyle with the scientific underpinning for the film. Boyle was reluctant to do this movie unless there was a good reason for the sun to be dying. He didn't just want it to be a twee um, um, science experience. He wanted it to be grounded in something real. And actually, this, this, this whole film has a, 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 an audio track dedicated to the scientific uh, reality, the underpinning of the film. Brian Cox provides a commentary for the film, which again, isn't common and and yes again people like Brian and they say like um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson hold up the Martian as being one of the greatest science fiction films ever made emphasis on science but in that sense sunshine deserves that as well Brian Cox even actually in the commentary picks himself up on a, a couple of errors that he makes for example when the the ship is leaving the uh, the orbit of Mercury and heading towards the Sun uh, again having had a brief pause he apparently got the trajectory wrong, uh, and so he, he owns up to that. The maths, apparently, um, had, had, had been overlooked. Uh, yeah, there is a scientific uh, uh, underpinning to everything that happens here, and I very much appreciated that when, it, when I first saw it in the cinema. This scientific underpinning extends to the characters. The crew are scientists, and therefore they solve problems in a scientific way. They debate uh, in a logical way, and when an idea is incorrect, it is immediately dismissed. This is familiar to me in my, my job and my background as an archeologist, uh, but also actually many of my friends and also my wife's friends are, are fairly well-respected you know physicists and chemists and, and they talk in a very similar way the actors uh, deliberately studied the way in which astronauts have to think but also the culture that they come from and so actually the science speak is very solid and so is the logic uh, Mace in particular uh, Chris, Chris Evans's character is at first a fairly I suppose unsympathetic character he comes across as overly willing to dismiss the importance of human life in in pursuit of the mission but actually there are a few out there are a few points in this film when he 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 brings everyone back on point he sort of says seriously we're really considering doing this silly thing when actually the mission is to save humanity he is uh, at times you, you sort of think oh you're being a bit a bit too Spock like there a bit too logical but actually, eventually in the movie, he applies the same logic to himself. He is as willing to sacrifice himself as he is to sacrifice others in the pursuit of a successful mission outcome. And again, this is uh, quite believable. This is, this is, as it were, science speak portrayed in a realistic way. Now, those of you who are fans of science fiction and cinema may well not be surprised that on the way towards the sun, they receive a distress beacon from 
the Icarus One. This mysterious ship that no one knows what happened to it uh, is apparently out there orbiting the sun in a very close uh, orbit. <laughs> And so the crew have to make a decision as to what they do. Do they uh, actually um, change their, their course by 1.1 degrees to, to, to reach the Icarus 1, perhaps rescue crew members who are on board, or do they continue with their, their planned trajectory towards the sun? Well, as I was just saying, this all comes down to logic. A scientific decision is made, and it is decided that actually it's better to have two last best hopes for humanity than one. Uh, that this bomb, as I say, was that it was mined from all of Earth's resources, and so actually using the one that wasn't used is probably a good idea as well, just in case as a backup. So the ship's course is changed, and they do in fact uh, meet the Icarus One. At this point. There is a, a, an interesting reminder of the, the fragility of the spaceship and the hazards of space travel. In changing the course of the ship, sadly, uh, Trey forgets to calculate uh, the necessary change in the angle of the shield to protect the ship. And things start, start to go wrong. The captain, Canada, and also Kappa are volunteered, as it were, to go out and fix the shield. And this is really where, where again, this is sci-fi at its best. The spacesuits are clunky. They cannot be put on um, by, by oneself. They have to be put on by another person. They are golden on the outside to reflect the intense heat and radiation from the sun. And everything is muffled. The sound is, uh, at this point, really playing into the fact that you're in, in a, inside a spacesuit, hearing, as it were, your own breathing, but also space makes no real noise. Uh, it is as though, again, they are entering that submarine-like environment. They are leaving the safety of the of the, the cigar and going into a hostile uh, area, a hostile space, literally. Here we come to what is really the main, the first major spoiler of the film, and I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to get into describe it. But I suppose what I would say is that this is really a point where the music plays such a central role in this film. It underpins really everything I've been talking about. It, the music reflects the design of the ship. The music reflects the lo logical approach of the astronauts. And the music reflects both the, the, um, uh, the Spartan uh, vacuum of space and the intense drama of what unfolds. Uh, it, it, in all seriousness, the soundtrack to this film really rises at points literally to meet the drama perfectly. It, it never never really oversteps its mark and it always helps the movie. Once the golden disc, the shield of Icarus II has been repaired, they do in fact dock with Icarus I. There's a hard dock, the two ships meet, and uh, members of the crew from Icarus II board Icarus One. It is a dusty, dark environment, and it seems that the, 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 that the entire crew is dead. But something which I really love is here, uh, you get literally flashes of brilliance. The cinematography, uh, as the uh, as the the crew are flashing uh, torches into the ship, uh, gives you hints of the ghosts that might be on board. Every single time a torch flashes across the camera lens, you are given a second, half a second, a fraction of a second, but nonetheless a, a flash of uh, crew members from the Icarus One. These are photographs that the astronauts have taken of each other, uh, really in moments of. of levity you know they're in zero g they're floating they're having fun and this this just flashes on screen in a similar way to maybe you see flashes of tyler durden um uh, ominously appearing in the first half of fight club here we're given a sense of of the 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 entities the ghosts that might be or indeed probably aren't on board icarus one um i really appreciated that it is it is creepy and it's not really something which I've seen done before actually encouraging actors to flash the torch in the camera's uh, eye as it were. 
At this point, something goes horribly wrong. And I'm not going to spoil what happens, but I will say that, that for many people, uh, this point in the film onwards is a sharp turn. Uh, the, t the film goes from being a sci-fi epic uh, along the lines of Alien or, or uh, 2001 to being more of a, a conventional slasher film, a haunted house in space, which actually is in keeping with Alien, but anyway. For some people, this is too much of a hard hard right turn, as it were, or left turn. And uh, at this point, many people, they kind of switch off from the film. Or at the very least, they, they are disappointed by the film. Whereas, actually, I see the last, the last third, I guess, the third act of this movie, as a ramping up of the stakes, emphasising and re-emphasising some of the core themes of the film. Ultimately, this apparently slightly controversial third act is all about the human will to survive. In fact, that's really what this whole movie is about. It's about humanity's desire to survive and also our ability to forge our own destiny. Yes, there is a there is a process that's occurring quite naturally, but we also have the scientific ability to to alter what happens uh, and, and in that sense there is a fairly explicit butting of heads between the question of whether or not we have the right to interfere and intervene in, in a natural process if the sun is destined to to to, to die and and earth itself is destined to freeze then who are we who are we to interfere as it were with you know with god's plan in this instance the sun being i suppose a representation a personification an orbification <laughs> of of god the final act of this film very cleverly plays with space and time in a way that is hinted at earlier in the movie uh, but is non nonetheless essentially highlighting the central role and presence of physics and theory in this drama. It also as well represents a, a personal choice. Certain characters really choose to commit <laughs> to their mission of saving the earth by literally jumping towards their eventual destiny. Uh, it, it's a pleasing and and an epic and and emotional ending to the movie, which is also boistered by that musical score that I mentioned earlier. The film isn't perfect. It does have its problems. But it does also deserve a place up there with films like 2001, like Moon, for example, Silent Running, um, I suppose to a certain extent Star Wars. Um, but despite that, this film doesn't have uh, as easy a path as some of those other movies. It can be a more difficult and slightly more demanding watch than other sci-fi epics. And so again, I can I can sort of see I can sort of see some of the problems here, uh, as well as some of the some of the real virtues of this film. But ultimately, I would strongly recommend watching this film if you haven't. It's one of my favourite sci-fi's. It's also one of my favourite. Uh, philosophical films I guess it's a it's a film that does do what it set out to do and in that sense it deserves praise uh, yes it confuses some people yes it frustrates others but ultimately it got me to watch it twice in a week at a point in my life when I had no real spare cash for the cinema I mean frankly I, I scarcely have spare cash for the cinema now but definitely in my third year at university uh, it took something special to make me go back again and uh, and this film is special anyway hopefully this has been an interesting uh, or hope uh, you know helpful uh, exploration of the film and if you haven't seen it before give it a go as ever guys until next time do take care bye bye